as an industry because if you can see that at the annual turnover, if it's 3.1 uh, trillion, then 10%, we, we said 10% of the total should be set aside for infrastructure uh, maintenance. And it is actually uh, 310 billion, but taking the average infrastructure asset life as 25 years, the annual global budget for maintenance infrastructure would be some 12 billion. It is actually a very sizable service, professional service, uh, what you call the uh, industry, if we take it as, as such. So, East State, I want just to mention East State. The East State, then, we have this maintenance of infrastructure as our priority program, you see. So, um, the we have, we have actually con conducted this maintenance of infrastructure workshop in India, Kenya, uh, Myanmar, Nigeria, and Malaysia. But then, closely associated with this infrastructure of, of, of uh, maintenance, it is this accreditation of engineering and technological uh, education qualification to international standard. Uh, firstly, in Asia and the Pacific, and this one we are working with UNESCO to try to, to get UNESCO to adopt the standard and then apply it to all universities and technical colleges so that it gives the, the quality of education more or less uh, international standard. And if this is accepted, it will lead to mobility of engineers and technicians across the region. So what, what I have tried to advocate now is Malaysia to be a regional centre for uh, training of uh, engineers and technicians in the maintenance of infrastructure. And this is also for Malaysia, but also for the rest of the developing countries to do South-South sub, sub cooperation. And then, uh, because I think that a lot of developing countries from Africa and Latin America they look to Malaysia as a good model to, you know, for economic and social development. Okay? And um, so I'm now having support from all the uh, Malaysian professional bodies who are engaged in human capital development in infrastructure and construction uh, to set up this regional centre for South-South cooperation in, in this. And then I... Uh, I also urge them that uh, the Malaysian service pro, uh, providers in infrastructure maintenance, uh, they should actually go overseas and mentor to set up similar service uh, providers in other South countries. So for this one, we need the help of government. But I'm trying to get this going because I, 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 I tell them that if they are able to help the other countries like African country to have their service provider in infrastructure maintenance, then you will actually build up a cohort of alumni of Malaysia. And this will actually have enable Malaysia to have friends in high places later on in Africa to help us, us get the infrastructure projects in, in Africa. But finally, I want to just mention the role of universities. I, want the, I, I think that the established universities, traditional universities, they are not able to train people in infrastructure maintenance because they are after R&D and you know, go up in ranking, in university ranking in the world, and then through publication and citation. So I think maybe the private university like Future University Sudan, they can take up this continuing professional development in, in infrastructure and then not only do a service for the country like Sudan, but also it is, a, I think, a very, can be a very profitable you know, so, uh, for, for the university concern. Thank you very much. IAP. 
with Bruce Alberts uh, in the United States. Uh, he's the co-chair of that IEP, still, I mean, very active. But uh, I think uh, always I remember uh, Professor Hassan, whenever I see him, I see twice. I mean, uh, Professor Hassan worked closely with the Nobel laureate, Professor Abdus Salam, for years in creating TWAS. He is a co-creator with Abdus Salam, the World Academy of Sciences, and he was the executive director. And this is where I met Professor Hassan, and from that time until now, that's for decades, we still colleagues, good friends, and whenever I look at him, I look to the history and the establishment and the creation of a world-class academy, TWAS, the World Academy of Science. Mm -hmm. Professor Hassan will moderate, will make comments. He has all the, f the time from now until lunch uh, to invite interventions, questions, and comments from the floor. Professor Hassan. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bedran, for uh, chairing this edition of the Future University Forum. Um, uh, many of you might, I'm, I'm sure uh, Professor Badran doesn't need any introduction, but many of you might not know that I regard him as my mentor, together with Abdul Salam. And uh, when he was in UNESCO, particularly when he was ADG Science, and then he became the deputy there at the general of UNESCO, I was working with Tuas, but Tuas was under UNESCO, so he was my boss when I was interested. And uh, not only me, he also mentored uh, Mustafa, uh, Tayyib, <laughs> Tayyib Mustafa, and Elias Baidul was his student. So the three of us, we thank you very much for this excellent mentorship. <laughs> and I'm sure that you all agree that he did a good job there. Huh? <laughs> okay, well, um, as Professor Badran uh, mentioned, uh, these three lectures are extremely Fascinating, really. Uh, first, uh, Farouk uh, uh, told us how space technology, space science, and space imagery in particular can be used very fruitfully to explore the resources of the Earth, especially underground. And he picked the example of water resources. Um, so I just wanted to mention here that this is not just a matter of looking at the data that you receive from satellites, because anybody can look at the data, but it is how you interpret the data. That requires a particular expertise like Baruch al -Bas, to tell us whether that area has got water or not water. So th this is a requirement that is quite unique, I think. And not many people have this talent and expertise to ex uh, explain the, the data itself that we receive from satellites. Uh, but then, um, Alec um, took us away from Earth. He launched us into space. The space of galaxies, of stars, of dark matter. And that was quite fascinating uh, uh, journey. And after that journey, that really brought us back to Earth. Uh, but this time, not, not underground, but on the surface. And he told us how, how infrastructure is so important and vital to address some of the very critical challenges that are highlighted by the Sustainable Development Goals, especially Sustainable Development Goal number nine, that this is specifically for, uh, with uh, infrastructure. So these are this really three very fascinating lectures, and we thank the three of them for that. Well, we're going to have uh, questions answers, I think we might have about half an hour, is that correct? Yeah. But let me just begin uh, by asking a, a question to each of our three speakers, just a very brief question. First, Farouk, um, I, I, I think what you have said about the, uh, the radiation uh, index and the aridity of the deserts is really quite frightening. But um, the question is, can, can this huge area, this vast arid area, can it be utilized uh, to solve particular problems? And, and in fact, that has already uh, been done in, in 
number of countries uh, using the desert to generate electricity from the sun. Because there we experience something like 3,000 to 4,000 hours per year of continuous sunshine. So how you can transform this into solar energy and use it for various purposes, I think this is something that's very challenging. And I would like you at least to comment, to comment on uh, some of the uh, projects that have recently been initiated, especially by Morocco. Uh, Morocco is now planning to produce at least 2,000 megawatts per year from solar energy by the year 2020. And this is quite substantial. I think it will uh, uh, meet at least 20% of the energy requirement of, uh, of Morocco. And they are aiming for something bigger. They are even aiming to draw a desert tech and move Can we learn some of the lessons that the Chinese 